Next up uh, is our second W7 keynote speaker, Dr. Naila Kabir. Naila Kabir has over 30 years experience working in, on the intersections between gender and socioeconomic inequalities. Naila is currently a professor of gender and development at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Naila will address COVID economic recovery and how responses must be shaped to advance women's and girls' rights. I think that it's going to dovetail very nicely from what uh, Theo was saying. Naila, we welcome you to the summit. And once again, can I just remind you to keep to time, uh, be as uh, short as you can, and I will let you know when your allotted time is up. Over to you, Naila. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to be here at the W7, and I hope that this is an opportunity for W7 to have some influence on the deliberations of the G7. Um, this year's uh, topic, of course, is COVID economic recovery and the stated priority of prosperity for all. Uh, so this is a moment in history, of course, uh, where the G7 leaders can prove themselves worthy of their titles by creating space for a new vision for recovery. The experience of COVID-19 has taught us some very profound lessons that we must factor in. Uh, it has been a human crisis in a very literal sense. It has attacked society at its very core in terms of lives, livelihoods, health and productivity. These are the capabilities that make us human. It has been an existential crisis. It has reminded us of our interdependence with each other in the most profound way. No one is safe from the virus unless everyone is safe from the virus. And it has revealed the stark inequalities that exist in society. Economic inequalities which are exacerbated by identity, location and voice. We knew that these inequalities existed, but did we know about their depth and their scale? We have, in the last several decades, been sold a vision of society that is based on a number of fundamental ideas. The first is that the road to prosperity is through economic growth. The second is that growth is measured by what you earn in the economy, not by what you contribute to the economy. The third is that economic growth will either trickle down or lift all boats. And finally, uh, there is an almost religious belief in the efficacy of markets and the private sector to maximize growth. The problem that we have faced is not whether we have grown or not, but that the wealth that we have generated has been concentrated in the hands of a very few people, the infamous 1%. If we look back at the last 30 or 40 years, what we see is the most powerful countries in the world and the most powerful institutions behind them have engaged in a steady and purposeful effort to reorganize the world in order to allow unregulated market forces to flourish. They have cut back on the state, uh, privatized its functions, reduced its capacity to raise revenue and to tax profits, and they have handed over responsibility for the public good to corporations. While each crisis in the past few decades has given us the opportunity to stand back and ask ourselves whether we're doing things the right way, each has been dealt with with an austerity paradigm with an austerity package that has kept the paradigm uh, intact. History keeps repeating itself and it repeats itself as tragedy. Perhaps this one, this crisis will be different because of its global reach, its duration, and its intensity, and because of what it has revealed about the inequalities in our midst. There is a yearly across much of the world that we do not go back to the old normal, that we build back fairer, more inclusively, and more resiliently. Now, a concern with gender justice has to be central to whatever we build back because a concern with gender justice challenges the basic tenets of the old paradigm. Let me offer some ways in which I think a gender just economic recovery might look. Basic key to fairer and more resilient economies is to invest in what we all share in common, our human capabilities. Central to those capabilities is our capacity and our responsibility to care for others and the right to be cared for by others equally. What the lockdown has re revealed is that there are these essential services that we all need to keep life going, but some of these are carried out for pay, very often very low pay in the market, but a great deal of it is carried out at home on an unpaid basis. These unpaid services are provided by women mainly in their capacity as wives and mothers. And, are, 
and they are frequently dependent on unreliable male breadwinners or unpaid on very low pay in order to survive. We know now that women make up 70% of the world's health services. We know that they do three quarters of the unpaid work in the world. We take this work for granted, but it has exploded into public consciousness because of the nature of this pandemic, the lockdown that has led to schools and workplaces closing down, everyone is at home and many are sick. It is not just the explosion in the demands on women's time that we are concerned about, it is what it has done to their ability to do very anything else. This is nicely summarized in an article by my colleague at LSE. Uh, I was facilitating everybody else's life and my my own life just ground to a halt. I should add that this struggle to look after your family and, and to try and uh, survive is true in normal times and is a major reason why women are not able to participate in various forms of uh, economic activity or in public decision making in the forums that make the rules of the game for our society. So a re recovery program that builds on just gender justice must build upwards from our human base. We need a population that is um, cared for, healthy, educated and protected. Feminists have been calling for greater investment in what we call the social infrastructure, in the essential services that contribute directly to our human capabilities, and that should be guaranteed to all. Because a universalism helps to build solidarity within society, it gives each person a stake, the status of a citizen, a stake in prosperity of that society, and the power to hold their governments accountable. These services must begin with sharing out of the responsibilities for unpaid care between men, women and the larger society through policies that will vary in different contexts. It may be infrastructure in some contexts, paid maternity leave in others. Beyond that, we need the other services that are essential, uh, health and reproductive services, uh, education, yes, lifelong learning and some degree of social protection so that we are able to work out how best to respond to changing economic opportunities and to withstand the next uh, crisis of the future. This should be the core element of the stimulus package, but it should also be the backbone of any new economy. Second, we need to shift the goal of the economy from creating wealth for a few to prosperity for all, from policies around growth to policies around decent jobs. The social infrastructure um, investment that I talked about has the advantage of not only being central to the agenda, to this agenda, but also having many gender equity synergies. For a start, it generates jobs far more than the physical infrastructure that has featured in stimulus packages. It generates a, a far larger number of jobs and many of those jobs will go to women. It lessens the burden of unpaid responsibilities on women, one of the main reasons for the stratification of the labor market that we see. And it will allow women to have some time to participate in citizens in the making of their society. And finally, we need to dethrone the private sector from its privileged position in the way we think about policy and to put accountable states and active citizens in charge. There may be areas of the economy where the private sector can be relied on to perform efficiently in ways that contribute to the public good. But the essential services that we are talking about is not those, those sectors. Moving from a language of private sector to public-private partnerships should not disguise the fact that it's the interest of the private sector that dominates in this very skewed partnership. And it is here where we see ideology consistently trumping evidence, because from the IMF to civil society to academics, we know that public-private partnerships are not necessarily, are, are more costly than public provision, are not necessarily more efficient and are inevitably less equitable because they abandon services to those who are hardest to reach, the poor and the marginalized. So the argument for PPPs has been used on the basis of the financial gap, but the state doesn't have fiscal capacity and must therefore turn to the, pub, uh, to the corporations. But the state does not have this capacity because it has been pressured to move away from progressive forms of taxation, to slash taxes on private capital, and to rely instead on indirect taxes, which falls most heavily on labor. There is room within an alternative economic paradigm for private corporations and for philanthropy. Uh, but their first duty is to pay the taxes that are proportionate to their wealth rather than taxes as rates lower than their employees. 
as the Dutch historian uh, Ratka Bregman said at his first visit to the Davos, to Davos, being in a conference full of rich people talking about philanthropy rather than their tax obligations was like being at a firefighters conference where no one is allowed to talk about water. The Biden proposal for a global corporate tax regime and an increase in the corporate tax in the US from 19 to 25 percent to me sounds like a very good start and I think my nine minutes are up. Yes, thank you so much.